This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast today for episode 106 is Jungian analyst and author Frith Luton in Melbourne, Australia. She holds a master's degree in analytical psychology from the University of Western Sydney and a graduate diploma in editing and publishing from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Her training as a Jungian analyst began at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich and was completed at the Research and Training Center for Depth Psychology, according to C.G. Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz, where she earned her diploma in analytical psychology, the degree of a Jungian analyst. Frith has presented lecture series to trainee analysts at the Research and Training Center and at the International School of Analytical Psychology, known as ISAP Zurich. She has also lectured at the Psychology Club of Zurich and the C.G. Jung Societies of Brisbane, Canberra, Melbourne, South Australia, and Sydney. In addition to practicing as a Jungian analyst, Frith also works as a professional astrologer. She holds a diploma in applied astrology from Astrosynthesis and is currently available for both consultations and supervision. Frith has also been a longtime professional book editor. Her multifaceted publishing career included eight years as an international travel guidebook editor, and more recently, she worked closely with Daryl Sharp, editing titles for inner city books. She is the author of Bees, Honey, and the Hive, Circumambulating the Center, a Jungian exploration of the symbolism in psychology, published by Inner City Books in 2011. You can hear our discussion about the book in Episode 3, recorded way back in 2015. In this episode, we'll be discussing Volume 6 of The Collected Works of Marie-Louise von Franz, titled Nicholas von Flew and St. Perpetua, a psychological interpretation of their visions, scheduled to be released by Chiron Publications on March 31st. This interview is being recorded on Tuesday, March 15th, 2022, through the magic of Zoom. I am so happy to speak with you again, Frith. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm happy to be back to talk with you again, too. So we last spoke back in 2015. It was just the third episode of this podcast. And I was wondering maybe if you'd like to give us an update on uh, your practice and your travels. I mean, things have been tough, right? The past couple of years there in Australia. That's right. But um, it matches with this uh inner material that we're going to be talking about today and uh, it's been a time of containment and inner reflection for some of us. That's a good point. It's been difficult but but also the birds have liked it, they've come come back, we've had parrots, rainbow lorikeets uh, carving out a nest in our street tree. I saw all sawdust on the on what we call the nature strip or the footpath and thought, what's going on here? And looked up and there were baby multicoloured rainbow birds in the the tree, whereas there'd be cars going to the train station park there all day and they they weren't happy about that. But, But the quietness and the lack of aircraft flying overhead all the time was was like a blanket of silence and you can deepen and um, reflect in a different way. But, of course, there's been hardships and uh, and um, deaths and lockdowns yeah. And, yeah. and the more shadow side of it. The shadow side of it, yeah. That's a great point. So I asked you to do this episode with me here today because the collected works of Marie-Louise von Franz are in process of being published in English by Chiron Publications. And 
When I saw the title of this volume, volume six, that is due to be released at the end of this month, I immediately thought of you because it is titled Nicholas von Flew and St. Perpetua, a psychological interpretation of their visions. And I remember back in episode three, when we discussed your book, Bees, Honey, and the Hive, you had a good bit of material in there about Nicholas von Flew. Yes, yes. I was inspired by Marie Louise von Franz's article, which is in Archetypal Dimensions of the Psyche, uh, called The Transform Berserker. It's called The Singing Berserker in this new volume. And it really inspired me, as well as my work as a beekeeper, inspired me to get working on, on uh, the honey and sting and, and the bee. Did you come across von Franz's article when you were training in Zurich? Yes, definitely. We had a reading seminar on that with Regina Schweitzer and uh, the various transformations of, of this it, that happened in Nikolaus's dream really struck me, particularly the, the honey. But I had read it when I first came to Zurich. I think Archetypal Dimensions of the Psyche was the first book I got out of the Institute Library and was reading back in my um, lodgings and and uh, the subtitle of it is The Union of Psychic Opposites and linking back to what you said before about the coronavirus times, uh, it starts off with, with this. In times of upheaval and social changes, people call for a leader who shows the way to either an inner change of attitude or an outer a change of social reorganisation, these two goals are opposed. And, and she goes on to say the central problem of the relationship between individual transformation and social responsibility, which, of course, we're dealing with in our current era, arises out of a psychic opposition. For as Jung explained, there's always two standpoints and there always will be, namely the standpoint of the social leader and sees the general welfare in the more, this is a quote, in the more or less total suppression of the individual and the spiritual leader, and that's like Nicholas, who looks for improvement only in the individual and they're a necessary pair of opposites which keeps the world in a state of balance. This is from von Franz's Transform Berserker. It is an essay in her book. Yes, it's actually more, to be more accurate, she lectured on this, this topic and I believe it's a transcript from, from that talk. So, But it is an art. It's been published by Shambhala as um, an article in this collection of articles called Archetypal Dimensions of the Psyche. And so... This volume, volume six of her collected works, is just on Nicholas von Flew and St. Perpetua, who we're going to get That's to right. a little bit later. So mm. let's go back to how this all started for, for you and von Franz. As I mentioned in the introduction, mm. you attended both institutes in Zurich. You started at the Jung Institute, the C.G. Jung Institute in Kusnacht, and then you transferred to the Research and Training Center. So what was your experience when you were there in Zurich? What did you know of Marie-Louise von Franz? It's an individual Knowing of her before I even got to Zurich, I, I loved her work. I'd been in an analysis here in Melbourne and in a fairy tale group, but I, I loved her depth and warmth of her writings. And so mm -hmm. I guess being an astrologer and someone very, very interested since childhood in the symbolic life, there was a lot of upheaval. It's interesting. There's a lot of upheaval in various uh, training places in Zurich at that time, and and so I, I wanted something very deep and uh, connected to 
like symbolic work and mm. it was strife at the institute and then ISAP came out of that in 2004. So I have wonderful memories of the eros of knowing students from three institutes in the in the end or th- not in, the centrum's not an institute but um all sitting on the rooftop of the place where we stayed preparing you know the night before our exams talking and and so I've got some dear friends and I, I lived in Zurich for several months a year even when I was training at Nikolausen um in with the centrum we had our block courses at a little village in Unterwalden called St Nikolaus, St Nikolaus, and so it was right at near the ramp where Nicholas had his hermitage. Because I, I think it's in, we probably need to tell the listeners a bit about uh, who he was and. Yeah. Uh, I just want to clarify for the listeners who might not be familiar when you refer to the centrum, mm. centrum. Centrum, like the centre, it's the diploma, it's the research and training centre in depth psychology, mm-hmm. according to Murray Louise von Franz and C.G. Jung, set up by von Franz really as the patron, just like inner city books had von Franz as their patron. She could see that uh, there was another way needed for people who were coming from overseas and to allow them to be in their own lives in their own countries and that was another reason why I made the decision about my own training path I needed to earn a living and be with my family and in my home country a lot of the time but I spent several months a year in Switzerland and that was wonderful when you were training with the Research and Training Center, what was the connection with Nicholas von Flew? Well, we we actually had our seminars in that village where that that's named after him. That we had residentials there, so we stayed at at that lo- lovely little village. But of, of course, it was a Zurich base for 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 the training. So let's get into who he was. For the listeners who are mm. not familiar with Nicholas von Flew, who technically now is a saint, he was canonized. Yes, he, he was canonized in um, 1947. Mm-hmm. And the 25th of September, I believe, is his feast day. He was beatified in 1669. So, yes, he was born in... Um, the 15th century, 1417, and he lived to the age of 70 years. And he started off when he was a young man being in the army and he got to the rank of captain and from about 1459 he served for nine years as a judge. So he was very much in a life uh, where he was contributing in that kind of way, but his visions led him on an, another inner path and he retreated to the ramp, this valley below the village of Nikolaus and, and lived apart from his family. You have the wife and ten children lived nearby, but that they were understanding yeah. and realised that uh, he needed to to go into this deep introversion and and uh, there was a hermitage built there and he had very simple room have you been there laura have you i haven't seen? no no mm-hmm. so it's it's a there's a house and there's a little river and then there's a chapel and then behind that is a simple construction with steps going up to an upper room and there was a stove there and a bench and uh, there was a there was a grill looking looking out into the chapel but he sat there he gave up his his outer prosperous family life in favor of this existence of fasting and I think they 
the um he starved he he lived on a eucharistic wafer and water that's right the hot the hot host and water i think and and it was quite cold there but he like in some of the sacred texts where you read about uh this tapas that i mentioned in my b book where where somehow the spirit warms the body mm-hmm. and you don't you don't die you can strip your life back to this stark essence which is like a quintessence it's it's like the essentials um and his visions led him to um to this place we often hear in this kind of material about the place being chosen and that's that's where he these lights in one of his visions took him back back to this place and he returned home and he contained he this is this containment he, he internalized his problems and concentrated i suppose on this inner work that gave him the ability to set an example i suppose he um manifest it as a very very spiritual influence in this place and it's a dark enclosed wooded valley and um that's um, to be understood von franz says as understood symbolically as the most deep withdrawal into oneself and as a turning towards the flow of inner life with in one's own soul that's why i think these visions are important both the times of perpetua and nicolaus were marked by as the introduction of this new volume tells us by a deep piety of individuals who wanted to find their way back to god not to the god of the church but to the pure divine source from which all life flows so hanzulieta the president of the foundation for jungian psychology in kusnak jung's home town writes in the intro introduction of of the volume perhaps at the beginning of the 21st century we'll experience a slow change or renewal of the image of god which is revealed through the inner soul experiences of individual people this would reconnect us to the archetypal current that works through the aeons so the volume actually contains 15 plus very very strong visions or dreams that struck or or sh- shocked the person who had them to to pay pay great attention and uh with C- brother klaus as nicolaus was called he established a pattern or set an example um which helped switzerland unify and probably helped switzerland contain and and be neutral and strong or and he's like the patron saint of switzerland hundreds of people used to line up outside his hermitage for healing and uh uh people went to him for advice for outer problems and he established this pattern or set an example von franz says which all of switzerland gradually followed and which he himself urged his fellow citizens to adopt namely and this is important to confine themselves to one place contained or a vessel in a way as a defense against the outside world and they thereby prevent shadow problems from exploding on the outside and that's your transform berserker you you don't go berserk and smash things up you actually can somehow combine the opposite people then had to deal with the shadow problems on an inner level and i think some of the current turbulence and political conflict and has come from you know the outbreak that we could the people weren't able to uh to deal with the shadow problems on an inner level von franz says that uh the red spirit of one's own aggression 
is transformed into a starting point for the dawning of consciousness. And, and Jung said, uh, in Switzerland, we've managed to reach the point of keeping our shadow problems within our own border. The next step would be for each individual to take on the conflict within himself or herself. This is the very step which Brother Klaus made by confining himself and his problems to the ramp to this small red reed. Um, a wonderful, clear instinct led him to this solution. This turning inwards is so meaningful because it was not forced upon him by a clash with the outside world or defeat from the outside. So it wasn't a, you know, the world's done me wrong, I'm going to withdraw. Um, it does not suggest a rift or flight from the world or from the shadow. It really seems to be more like an active insight into the meaningfulness of the inner life. Um, so he did go through a lot of personal suffering to reach this point and the visions really guided the way and that's what what uh, the analytical psychology, Jung psych, depth psychology can help us with our dreams are like way markers if we can, as I said in the episode three, follow that red thread of connection between what's coming up in the symbols, it can transform and, and guide us. I found it remarkable that he lived to be 70 years old. This was back mm. in the 1400s. Mm. So he was mm. a strong man. He had 10 children. Uh, he was married for 15 years. And then he went into this seclusion, but to live to be 70 back in the 1400s, I found that interesting. And then so you mentioned the name Brother Klaus. That's also what Nicholas von Flew was known by. And yes. there is yes. an essay written by Jung uh, that is included in co his collected works, Volume 11, Psychology and Religion. And it is titled Brother Klaus. And in that essay, Jung says that he lived a long life in the realms of the soul. Mm. He, and he also points out that great saints were sometimes great heretics. Uh, I find that interesting as well. Mm. Well, I really suffered the extreme opposites. I think he, he wasn't a heretic, uh, uh, Nicolaus. But, uh, no, but no. Von Franz talks about the dreams of saints being quite, uh, you know, shadowy um, or... The, the opposites are there. So, so somehow this very, very strong sense of the instinctual life, the sexual life, that, that can come up in the dreams of saints. And, and so there, there's this grappling with, with uh, transforming the berserker, finding a middle way for the, the opposites. And, yes, that... that um, essay or that that's actually a book review yes, in, that's in right. volume mm -hmm. um and the volume, volume 11. 11 psychology and religion west and east and and it's interesting because Jung, Jung's um one of the things that I I know from reading the visions and I was familiar with the German version in the past so it's you you were probably uh wise approaching me because I, I the volume six it contains the English translation of, of that but uh, in in the last section it's called the terror about the vision of the terrifying face of God and it, there's this um little, painting that's been what we would call curated or sanitised of, of this terrible face and, that, and it's not terrible anymore and Jung's more or less uh, pointing that out in, in a very C.G. Jung way that uh, that particular rendition of this vision is far from terrifying but the actual raw material was absolutely terrifying and and people said that Nicolaus, his whole demeanour and 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 Visage's face showed it like the 
as if he'd been struck by holy law or, yeah. or lightning and, and, of course, prophets and uh, sages often and shamans and Jung, Jung and both Bon France have talked about the Wotanic god of the storm, um, shamanic northern uh, European connection with cosmos and nature being really, really important with Nikolaus and uh, the, that source of inspiration, um, the, the actual final paragraph of the Nikolaus section of the, this volume six says the relationship Brother Klaus had to nature um, was constellated through invasive archetypal con content. So you can be... If you're unwell psychologically, you can be totally overcome by very strong, terrifying archetypal contents in a dream. And, you know, that's, that could be someone who's suffering with, with psychosis. But, but if, if, you, if Jung and Von Prantz both say this about, about uh, shamans and, and Nikolaus, that, Jung says very categorically that he was he was psychologically whole and well. Uh, there were times of suffering, but but actually that uh, if that individual can find a way out of their starkly individual um, visitation through a vision or a dream and not be wiped out by it, the power of it, they can go on to heal others. And Laura, you probably picked up on the comment in this volume that uh, Jung said that Nikolaus really should be regarded as a patron saint of psychotherapy because he yeah. actually could just by making a common sense, incisive, strong comment, probably coming out of a combination of his lived experience through all the different phases of his life, could make a difference to people's wellness and healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Jung related to him. He referred to him as my brother Klaus. And, yes. Uh, and, yeah. and I found a lot of references, and this is something I want to ask you about. I found a mm. lot of references to Nicholas von Flew or brother Klaus, as Jung refers to him, throughout Jung's collected works and in mm. his letters, mm. uh, especially yes. in volume one of his letters, uh, in a letter mm. to Mary Mellon. And mm. there's mm. some others, uh, quotes I pulled out and tweeted mm. while I was reading. So my question to you is, why do you think, uh, and we haven't really talked much about his visions, but why do you think Von Flew was so, uh, I don't know if important is the right word, but for Jung and Von Franz to write about him as much as they did, and then for an entire volume of Marie Louise von Franz's collected works to be devoted to to him well, and to Saint Perpetua, who we will get to here. Uh, why do you think that he was that important? Well, Nicolas was important to the Swiss because he helped unify Switzerland and mm -hmm. and was a larger than life but very humble, grounded figure. So. There's that, but but also his life and his visions and and the effect that he had on unifying the surroundings is a very very um, to the point example of what we call what Jung called the individuation process, mm -hmm. um, where we transform through deep attention to our inner life and not without suffering, but um, these visions are the raw material and they are a bit like Jung's red book. And so, yeah, they had a healing effect on many people and also the, the social fabric and, and uh, yeah, transformed yeah. This, this berserker image that can smash and destroy and um, 
von Flu is a real life example. Yeah. And so Jung, yeah. Jung was using him as an example. Well, an illustration, he was struck by the depth and psychological connection in this, this man's whole life because d- remember that, uh, that there was uh, a section called the prenatal faces and baptismal visions. So there's this sense that even, even at the start of this life, there was a sense that uh, that it was a transpersonal life, and he he said, uh, you know, that this this is an example of a creative Christian um, mystic that that attained archetypal dimension, and uh, he lived in a time of great crisis, and somehow mm-hmm. unified the people and him and his warring opposites I, I suppose you could say we should move on to perpetua now mm-hmm. i was familiar with uh marie louise von franz's book that was published by inner city books in That's 2004 right. titled the passion of perpetua a psychological interpretation of her visions And that book started as an academic study for a seminar with Jung. Uh, It was first published in English back in 1949, and then published in German in 1951 as a supplement to Jung's volume Aeon, which is volume nine, part two of his collected works, uh, subtitled Mm -hmm. Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self. So Mm -hmm. St. Perpetua was the patron saint, is the patron saint of mothers in the Catholic pantheon, And she Mm. was an African Christian, and she Mm. did not live at the same time as von Flew. She lived way back in, she was martyred. 1,300 years before. Yeah, in, in, I was going to say 2003. No, it's 203. She was martyred in 203. So would Mm. you tell us a little bit about her? Um, Yes, I'd say something else about this Aeon. In the German uh, edition of Aeon, this perpetua uh, visions of per- or the passion, meaning the the death, like Christ's passion uh-huh. on Good Friday, was published as I believe um, from learned friends in Zurich as a counterbalance to the kind of spirit of Aeon. So it brings in in a feminine aspect to it, and von Franz had. Um, prepared it as a, a book review when she was in this uh, the seminar with with Jung. Perpetua was only twenty two when she was martyred, and she did have a young child. So therefore, yeah. that's probably where the mother association comes comes from. And I guess that she has recorded her own dreams and looked into them in her own way at that time when she was in prison previous to her martyrdom and the last the fourth vision was actually the day before her martyrdom before she was led out and um, put into an arena and and died and she would the the dreams the visions helped her cope with with her fate so in those early days the martyrs were prepared to die for their faith and so she she was imprisoned for being a christian yes yeah yes so they reveal there's four of the visions and and they reveal i suppose that kind of balance of opposites, uh, archetypal opposite, going right to the up to the end of the martyr's life, the tension of the wrenching apart of those opposites, von Franz said, produced a new life energy, which the Christian culture of the following centuries was to build afresh. But she 
was struck by the fact that the unconscious itself in the form of what came out as visions sustained the martyrs with images holding the promises of a new life. Remember the shepherd feeding her cheese in the first vision when she goes up the ladder and giving them inner strength to stand by their decision to to actually uh, make the ultimate sacrifice. And the, these visions reveal, you know, Jung talked about how important it was to not just work with one single dream or um, artefact from the unconscious vision uh, in this case. Uh, a series gives you much more of a, a thread and de- sense of development in the individuation process. And I think that's why these the visions of these two are so important. They're, they're difficult to sit with and to understand and, and work with, but it's very, very rewarding and gives you confidence not to try and take shortcuts or give up if you're in analysis, for example. So the visions revealed in a kind of uniquely complete form the whole unconscious situation of humanity at that time when there was a link between the pagan and the Christian uh, in the last dream she has to fight this there's some very big figures, one's positive and one's negative and one's the past, the pagan past, and the others shows the Christian development. So they also, the whole series of visions show the conflict that Christians experience in trying to tear themselves free from the spirit that's bound up in nature that's interesting because Nicolaus nature was so important and that's that yeah. wotanic shamanistic side cosmos and nature were very important but here in this um, early Christian series of visions her dream her visions are showing the conflict that Christ, uh, Christians experienced in trying to free themselves from the spirit bound up in nature and in matter uh, martyrdom itself, von Franz said, had no other meaning, quote, than to demonstrate to the pagan world this complete separation and the absolute belief in a world beyond. And that world beyond in, in these visions is very different to the world beyond in the shamanic, more nature-bound sense that, that some of Nicolaus's dreams of visions show. Um, the visions of Perpetua show hard battles that the believers at the time had to fight within themselves and how deep the inner struggle, which had broken out between two divine, super personal, unconscious powers was. So I guess this is a psychological encapsulation that that help us understand some more about this thing of martyrdom, which is can be seen, von Franz said, as tragic unconscious martyrs can be seen as tragic unconscious victims of the transformation, which was then fulfilled deep down in the collective stratum of the human soul. This was the transformation of the image of God, whose new form was to rule over the aeons to come. So yeah, I pulled it, that same quote actually. That's on page yeah. two hundred and three. Yeah, so that's that was the closing paragraph of this this volume. And um, if we read Aeon and read Perpetua's visions at the same time, that it, it shows a, a different well, the transformation of the God image, but also the sense of symbols of the self and. Nicolaus's visions really are, I recommend them to people to, to, to ponder and um, reflect on, on that. And there's some wonderful uh, commentary by von Franz, an amplification of the symbolism. We haven't 
got time to go through and read the texts of the whole 15 plus visions, but it's like an appetizer, a, you know, um, invitation to to those listening to to consider if they're up for looking at some really strong psychological raw material like the you know it it, it people know about the negredo the prima materia and that then how that can transform with consciousness into the whitening or the albedo and then then the red rebedo or life force comes and and uh, the the sense of the inner self or inner containment or solidity that that helps you keep calm even if there is a pandemic or a, a war uh, you know at the moment we've got the Ukraine situation which is shocking us and the spirit of the people or the individuals is is really something that's uh, been an archetypal thread even though we we can have extreme uh, situations that we have to live through and yes what you said before about Nicolaus living till he was 70 was that was really something but Perpetua sacrificing her life and leaving her child and and being imprisoned and losing her life at 22 that's Mm -hmm. that's a whole different situation which is something that we find very difficult to to understand but uh, when you read these visions you'll have a sense uh, like uh, maybe I should I have a little quote from the vision four okay. um, the, the last bit of it she she'd gone through this fight in the amphitheater and this this um, Lanista the trainer of the gladiators an archetypal positive figure had come he carried a rod like a trainer of gladiators, Lanista, and a green bough on which hung golden apple trees, and he called for silence and spoke. This Egyptian here, which is the, the terrifying um, figure that she had to fight, if he's victorious, will kill her with the sword, and if she vanquishes him, she will receive this bough, this, this golden apple branch. Thereupon he withdrew. And we fell upon each other and began to deal blows with our fists. He endeavoured to seize me by the feet, but I trod upon his face with the soles of my feet and I was lifted up in the air and began to trample him as if I myself no longer touched the ground. But when I saw that I was getting no further in this way, I clasped my hands together and seized his head. Then he fell upon his face and I trod upon his head and the people began to shout and my assistants to jubilate, to cheer. However, I went up to the Lanista and received the bow and he kissed me and spake, daughter, peace be with thee, then wreathed in glory with the laurel leaves on her head, I began to go towards the gate of the pardoned and I awoke and understood that it was not with the beast but against the devil that I should have to fight, but I knew the victory would be mine. And uh, when she was led into the arena, Others sang, she and others sang psalm, psalms in ecstatic exultation, but she was immediately knocked down by a mad, mad cow that was let loose upon her and uh, her dress was torn. And then Felicitas, the other mar- fellow martyr, um, helped her and she was put to death by a gladiator who actually didn't have very good aim and it wasn't that pretty death but she took the knife the sword um from the young gladiator and guided it to her throat and and it was though so great a woman feared as she was by the unclean spirit um could not be dispatched unless she herself were willing Mm -hmm. so that's a quote that last bit so it's quite stark and as is the terrifying vision of the face of god of 
of Nikolaos, which really made him very sure that he needed to withdraw and have a healing effect through his ability to be contained and sit in that spot. That vision of the terrifying face of God that is uh, included in, I wanted to mention in chapter 12, because the way that this volume is laid out, it's in two books. Book one is The Visions of Nicholas von Flew, and book two, The Passion of Perpetua. And yes. And in book one, uh, there are illustrations and an introduction, and then there are 12 chapters uh, that go over uh, his time and his visions, and actually there, there's quite a bit, uh, his retreat, and uh, yes, and then the transformed berserker, as you mentioned, is titled The Vision of the Singing Berserker. That's right. right. That's chapter nine. And then in book two, The Passion of Perpetua, it contains the original editor's foreword, which uh, was written by Daryl Sharp, and then an introduction, the text, a few other chapters about her life, and then her visions. And then von Franz interprets the first vision, the second and third visions, and the fourth vision. And then there's an appendix. So I just wanted to give the listeners an idea of what is contained in this volume. It's not uh, nearly as long as uh, the first three volumes that have been published. This book is around uh, 211 pages. I think that uh, the reading of the visions and amplification, which was Jung's method of working with the symbolic, like ex expanding them out. And so von Franz says the dragon is does not just equal the devil in the first vision of Perpetua. It, it is some, something else. And, and so in the, this volume you get a real sense of why the psychological amplification of the visions are so so important because it actually demonstrates a lot of people don't realize what dedication to a uh, working in a well-sealed vessel or or contained analysis is all about and they they're ready to break out after one or two sessions because it's not not for them and that that's fine but that this shows that these visions sh show and the processes of these two mm -hmm. individuals that were really committed to paying attention to yeah. what the unconscious could bring up to consciousness to help them live their lives or, or live their, their, their martyrdom is very important. And uh, once we have the ability to hold a, to transform our raging side and not go and uh, knock on our neighbor's uh, door and and abuse them <laughs> but to to let things transform it's wonderful there's a, a wonderful woman in our street who's managed to plant a lot of trees near the train station and she's she talks with eros to the local government officials and gardeners she doesn't say this is disgusting we, it's not good enough she says well how about we do this and do that and, and the bridges and the help has been marvelous and uh and some of the fairy tales just show you don't go and shine a, a flashlight, you say, in North America, we say a torch in someone's face if they've done something wrong. You hope that they will, through the wisdom, transform and, and live their life in a different way. I, I think I would really love to end with my two maxims, yeah. Laura. I, I tell my analysts over and over again about wisdom and eros being key. And Jung says about wisdom, wisdom is never violent. Where wisdom reigns, there's no conflict between thinking and feeling. That's in volume 14. And then in paragraph 330, he says, tears, sorrow and disappointment are bitter, 
but wisdom is the comforter in all psychic suffering. Indeed, bitterness and wisdom form a pair of alternatives. Where there is bitterness, wisdom is lacking, and where wisdom is, there can be no bitterness. That's very important if you find yourself unravelling or getting angry. And then the other one, which we all love and know, is from Volume 7, Paragraph 78, where eros reigns or love reigns, there's no will to power, and where the will to power is paramount, eros is lacking. The one is but the shadow of the other. So thank you, Laura, and uh, I appreciate this opportunity to introduce uh, people to what is very, very rewarding but maybe difficult material. It is, but it is rewarding. And and I can understand it so much better now, having spoken with you and heard uh, your, your, your interpretation of it, and uh, it made it more interesting to me. So I want to thank you for that. Please visit the website, speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. Speaking of Jung is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel, Jungian Laura. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device, simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. Links to Amazon's new Echo devices can be found in the show notes. So with special thanks to Dr. Stephen Buser and Jennifer Fitzgerald at Chiron Publications, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.